Welcome back to the report. We are diving into the world of planetary science to focus on one of the most iconic features of our solar system, Saturn's rings. Now, new data has been published which suggests that these rings are much younger than most scientists had previously thought. As more questions arise surrounding the viability of conventional origins models, many evolutionists are struggling to reconcile their theories with the mounting evidence. Joining us today is David Coppage, an astrophysicist who brings firsthand insights from his impressive 14-year tenure working for NASA's JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, he spent nine of those years as the systems administrator for the Cassini mission to Saturn, overseeing the communication systems that connected Earth to the Cassini spacecraft. David just published a new article in the Creation Club magazine titled Saturn's Rings Are Young, where he breaks down data from several of the most recent studies on the topic. We are excited to have David here to discuss his research and some of the highlights from his article. David, you've been to Africa with me on Photo Safari and you've been all around the world, but it is great to have you back on the report today. It's good to be back with you, David. How are you today? I am excellent. Uh, could not be better. Listen, to start, what do you believe are some of the key forces that are contributing to the destruction of Saturn's rings? Because we see that this is one of those components showing potential youth. Well, as you know, Saturn's rings are one of the most beautiful objects in the solar system, and perhaps you've uh, photographed them yourself in some of your astrophotography days. Uh, uh, many people, when they look at Saturn, they are just so impressed. They're, they have a jewel-like quality up there. And yet the rings are young. They cannot be as old as Saturn itself. And that's a new consensus that planetary science have, scientists have come to because there are numerous forces that are at work trying to disrupt the rings. Uh, one of them is just collisions within the rings. The particles jostle and bump against each other, and this grinds them down. Uh, down to powder over time. Another thing is there's gas drag. In other words, the outer atmosphere of Saturn uh, tends to extend out into the rings and cause particles to lose energy, and that, that causes them to spiral into the planet. Another force is sunlight pressure, the so-called Poynting-Robertson effect you may have heard of. And this causes particles to lose energy and so they'll fall they'll spiral into the nearest gravitational well which is Saturn itself and uh, the big thing that is uh, causing the rings to decay rapidly is micrometeorites in other words uh, microscopic particles are impacting the ring rings constantly and at JPL the instruments were able to actually hear the impacts of these rings uh, of these impacts on the sound of the impacts on the rings and they produce oxygen that was a signature so you could hear these constant pings of particles hitting the rings and when these particles impact the ring uh, when these micrometeorites impact the rings they blast off material uh, much more material than is added to the rings and so one of the main papers that came out last year in 2023 in summer was that uh, these micrometeorites are adding dirt to the rings. Now, the rings are very clean. They're almost all water ice with some impurities. But these micrometeorites are, you know, dirtying the rings, basically, and collecting like dust bunnies on the particles. And so this should add up very quickly over time. Uh, in fact, if there were just one gram of material per square foot per year, it would be a substantial amount over four and a half billion years, the assumed age of the solar system. Yeah, that's that's definitely a problem once you start to stack on years. It's not really a problem for a, a young universe cosmology, but when we're talking about billions of years, it everything becomes a problem. I love uh, some of the verbiage in one of your articles here. Um, uh, this offers no hope for believers in deep time because it is a belief system. Uh, you mentioned um, multiple problems, but that all of these things are stacking up to constraining the age of the rings to a few hundred million years at most. Now, you mentioned at one point, some authors have set upper limits of 15 to 400 million years for the rings, right? I, that's quite a discrepancy. That's not narrowing it down too much. 
But in terms of scientific estimates, how can we determine exactly how young the rings are based on research? You mentioned dust collecting within the ring. You mentioned multiple clues, but is there a way that we can really hone in on close ages for these rings? Well, the ages that they're putting on the rings are upper limits. In other words, uh, they cannot be older than 15 million or 400 million, whatever value you want to land on. But uh, that's like saying, you know, a skyscraper can't be taller than the moon. <laughs> right. In other words, it's, it's a, the upper limit may be a ridiculous number. Yeah. And no, we cannot say that the rings are just a few thousand years old. However, we can look at the processes that are at work and determine these upper limits are actually far less than what they're saying. And so there were three papers in the summer of 2023 that agreed that the rings are young. Yeah. Uh, and I have a way of expressing how this is a problem for believers in deep time. I, I have a 45-foot rope that I sometimes take on demonstrations. In fact, I used this in a breakout session when we were both at in Dallas last summer for the eclipse. Uh, and so this is, if this were a timeline, I stretch this out in front of the stage, usually it covers the whole stage. And I ask the people, okay, on this 45 foot rope, how much is a hundred million years represent? Yeah. And the surprising answer is just one foot. <laughs> so, you know, just about this much on this rope is a hundred million years, mm -hmm. okay? and. 10 million is one tenth of that. So now we're talking about just inches. Wow. And 1 million is one tenth of that. So we're down to like millimeters. And so it, it becomes apparent very quickly that, that uh, we're talking about just a tiny fraction. 100 million years is just a tiny fraction of the age that they assume for the rings. Yeah. And if this were the only thing that were constraining the age, it would be one thing. And yet, uh, there are multiple problems at Saturn and other planets on the solar system that have these upper limits. Absolutely. And we can talk about those. But you have specifically been focusing in on, you worked on the Cassini mission, you worked uh, with JPL, uh, putting all of these systems in place. And even during that mission, you talked with some of your colleagues, with other planetary scientists, with, with those that you know, uh, about this potential problem of Saturn's rings, didn't you? Yes, uh, I had contact with some of the leading planetary scientists. Now, I have to state clearly that I was not working as a scientist. I was working more as a uh, computer technician. And yet, I remember having lunch with some of these people and in their planetary science conferences, I would ask them questions and listen to them. And they were baffled by the age of Saturn's rings. They had no no clear answer. Uh, I remember one ringmaster, I call him uh, the the experts on planetary rings. Uh, <laughs> I asked him, or I I asked, yeah, I asked him personally one time why he was trying to get the rings to be billions of years old, and it was more of a philosophical thing. He didn't want to believe that humans appeared on the Earth in just the right time to see this beautiful wonder of nature. Wow. Uh, it it would seem like we were living in a special time. And so there was a philosophical reason, I think, behind this. Yeah, well, you gathered a ton of data uh, with the Cassini missions, with being able to get up close to some of those beautiful structures. Uh, but what kind of responses do you typically hear? You interface with a lot of people and present some of these challenges to old old earth or old time periods, long time periods. What are some of the responses that you hear when you converse with your colleagues on this? Well, they, they try to, they have to admit that the rings are younger than Saturn. There's really no argument against that anymore. Actually, there was a paper this uh, just a few days ago that tried to preserve them for a billion years and yet they're ignoring uh, the main problems. For instance, particles from Saturn's ring are falling into Saturn all the time. In fact, 10,000 kilograms per second are being lost from the rings and flowing into Saturn. That's enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in about a half an hour. So you have this constant ring rain, it's called, and they realize that the rings are ephemeral. They, they cannot last for billions of years. 
And uh, one interesting reaction I see often in papers and press releases is that they try to change the subject real quick and talk about, well, if there's water in the rings, maybe there's life there or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, a, a pivot is okay, and those are things that obviously we would love to discuss, but pivoting when the evidence doesn't quite support uh, your paradigm is not going along with good observational science. It is simply diverting to other issues. I think we have to be intellectually honest and say that it's really time to rethink the age of all of the planets in our solar system, the age of the universe, the age of Saturn's rings, uh, plus with all of the things when uh, the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune are winding down, everything is sort of capping limits. And uh, I think it's something that it's, it's really time that we begin to dive into and embrace. We need to change perspectives. Uh, David, you actually just had an article on the Creation Club magazine, which I cannot wait for people to read. Uh, I wanna thank you for your expertise. And finally, last few seconds, what should we take from all that we're learning with cosmology now? Well, like you say, the heavens declare the glory of God. And uh, one reason they want to maintain deep time is, is because Darwin needs the time to evolve brains from bacteria. So if he doesn't have that time, then it's a strong argument against Darwinism. And a strong argument towards the idea that we have a creator who has designed each and every one of us with purpose and has also given us the intellectual capacity to study, to send probes to Saturn's rings and to learn more about his creation. Thank you, David Coppage, for joining us today. And that is it. I wanna thank everyone for joining us on the Genesis Science Report. And until next week, I wanna remind you all, keep looking up, I'm David Reeves, truly, the heavens declare the glory of God.